Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome to Anne Arundel Community College's fall 2017 semester, first eight-week term, and this is the CTS 230, Section 841, Networking 3, or the Scaling Networks V6 course from the Cisco Networking Academy. This video tutorial and solution set is going to be on Packet Tracer Activity 1.3, dot one dot three, which is the first skills-based assessment for the Scaling Networks V6 course. Now, it's important to point out that we're covering the brand new material released literally a month ago by Cisco. So this is the Scaling Networks V6 course. So this is not going to be covering any of the V5 course material or packet tracer activities that you would have seen in what is now referred to as sort of the legacy Scaling Networks course. So this will be Scaling Networks V6, and this is for Packet Tracer Activity 1313. And you can see I've got an image of the textbook on the left, which you can see right here, as well as the course booklet, which is literally the in-class labs that we'll be doing throughout this semester. So before we dive in, let's cover some very important logistics here. Now, the first thing that we need to cover is the version of Packet Tracer that you should be using in order to successfully complete these activities. Now, you'll see in the image that I have just pulled up here where that is what the first activity is going to look like. This 1.3.1.3 activity is gonna look like this, where you've just got sort of these lines here and some clouds and it says intranet one, and you've got some addressing information. Now, take a look at the version of Packet Tracer that's being run. So 7000306, that is not the version of Packet Tracer that you wanna be using. So if you're using a 7.0 release of the Packet Tracer software, you're gonna to wanna to upgrade that to the latest and greatest, which is 7.1. Now, if you're running 7.1, you're not going to have this problem here. And you're probably looking at this saying, well, I'm not sure what is the problem. What is it supposed to look like? Well, let's go ahead and pull that up. And I will show you here what that is going to look like. So here is what the activity should look like, where we've got some PCs, some file servers, the admin router, and we've got intranet one, intranet two, and then internet over here on the left. And again, if I were to go to help and about, this is the version of Packet Tracer, and this is the most recent version right here, version 7.1.0.0222. And it is only with this version that these activities are going to fully function without any major issues. I'm sure we're sure we'll still run into some of the bugs that we typically see associated with a new release of software or a new release of activities, but we can deal with those when we come to them. So let's go ahead and dive in and tackle Packet Tracer Activity 1.3.1.3. So we can see here we've got our addressing table and they've kindly put in the subnet mask for us here in dotted decimal notation. You can see we've got some sub interface work that's gonna be taking place. We've also got some serial interfaces off of this admin device here. So the scenario is, and really what the expectation of this activity is that we're going to now be pulling together all of the skills that you have acquired in the previous two Cisco Networking Academy courses. In other words, the Networking 1 and Networking 2 courses, the Routing and Switching Essentials V6 and the uh, Introduction to Networks V6 courses. Now those courses also have the new material released already. And so this is going to be in line with those or with that curriculum, the V6 curriculum. 
So let's dive in here and let's see what we've got. So all devices in the topology, except for admin, admin switch, and IT support, which is this PC here, are already configured and you don't have access to the other routers. So literally, we're gonna be looking at the admin router, the admin switch, and then the IT support PC. Other than that, everything here has already been configured. So let's jump in and begin our configuration work. Now I'm gonna enlarge this. Uh, the changing the options here at the top, there's a view or there's an options dropdown, uh, is not actually functioning and it's not actually allowing me to make this text any larger here. So we're gonna be sort of stuck working uh, with this text. Let me see if I can magnify. Well, we don't wanna do that. So we're gonna go ahead and leave this. Yeah, it's either 100 or 200. So we're, we're gonna leave this where it's at. Uh, and again, this is in 1080p HD, so you should be able uh, to see, and, I, and again, I'll be commenting as we work through the activity. Now, on the HQ switch, what is it we need to do? Well, it says configure remote management access, including IP addressing and SSH. Well, as all Cisco activities go with Packet Tracer, there's going to be a lot of implied things that need to be done. In other words, they're not going to explicitly tell you run this command, type this in. It's things that you're going to have to know from your previous studies and infer from the activity. So on the HQ switch, and also if you look down here in the lower right-hand corner, you're gonna see that completion percentage, that zero out of 75, and we'll use that as our guide. So let's go from user exec to privilege exec with the EN or enable command, and then let's go from privilege exec into global config with the conf T or the configure terminal command. And so this puts us into global config. You can see there's no enable password right now. So we were able to transition from a user with no privilege to basically the super user or the root user into privilege exec mode. Now the domain is cisco.com. So in order to set the domain, we say IP domain name cisco.com, right? Very straightforward. You can see that we've already been given two points for the completion of that step. Now, it says enable secrets should be Cisco EN pass for Cisco enable password. So how do we do the enable secret? Well, we say enable secret, and then we put in the password. So we'll say Cisco EN pass. And you can see down in the lower right that we got bumped up one point. So we know we're on the right track. Okay, now user admin with password let me in. So here's one of those things or one of these uh, one of those tasks where you might be asking yourself, well, it says user admin with password let me in. So what's the privilege that I should set? And should I be using the secret, right, the MD5, or should I use password, which would be a type 7 password? And in legacy activities, there were some cases where it would not give you the points if you were using the MD5 hash. In other words, that secret keyword in the command, and that you would simply have to leave it with just the password. So let's see what they're looking for here. So we're going to say username, capital A, admin, if I do a question mark, you can see we've got password or privilege. Well, it doesn't indicate the privilege level, so we're going to let it default. But here we go. Is it password or is it secret? Now, remember, if I say password and I put let me in and hit enter, we were at three points. Do we see it bumping up here? We don't, right? So the inferred option, and I'll say no username adword, admin password let me in. So it's implied that we are going to be using, and again, uh, in terms of Packet Tracer, remember that Packet Tracer is a trimmed down version 
an extremely trimmed down version of the Cisco iOS. And so here's where I'm going to say user admin secret, and then we'll say let me in. And the reason that we want to use secret is because that is considered a better practice than using the password keyword. And the reason for that is, and again, if I were to go back real briefly here, let me pull this back. And if I were to put in username, admin, password, let me in and hit enter and say, do show run. You can see that, and we haven't actually done the um, service password encryption yet. So you can see it's in clear text. And I know that they're going to have us put in that service password encryption. So let me do that first. We'll say do show run. So here's what you get is you get sort of this veneer cipher of the output. Now, I can take that and cut and paste that into any number of websites. All I have to do is Google crack Cisco Type 7 password. So let's pull Chrome up here, and hopefully this doesn't take too long. As you can see, I'm doing this on a virtual machine running on a very old iMac uh, with not too much horsepower. And so sometimes when we go to do things, you may see the little rainbow uh, spinning circle where it's thinking. Uh, so we'll wait for that to come up. And so here it comes. So if I was to basically Google crack Cisco Type 7 password, um, it's going to take me to any number of sites on the internet where I can simply paste in and let's go to google.com, where I'm simply going to be able to paste in that password. So crack, type 7, and take a look at that. They already know what we're looking for. Type 7 password, oops, sorry, password, Cisco. And we're going to hit a whole bunch of sites. We'll go to this one here, iBeast, and I'll paste in the password, hit submit, and that wasn't too difficult now, was it? Right? So again, I'm stressing it's a better practice to use secret, right? That's what we want to do. And actually, it's kind of uh, interesting. Don't be thrown off here. That four, the reason it incremented is because I implemented the service uh, password encryption, which I know that they have to be asking us to do later on here. So let's pull out that bogus username or the bogus user account, and let's put in what they're looking for here. Username admin, secret, let me in. And so now we should go from four points to five points. And again, I need to make sure that I stress, and are they going to give us any credit for that? It does not look, username admin, secret, let me in. It doesn't even look as if that was going to be worth any points at all. So we say do show run. And so you can clearly see that this is far more secure than that, without question, right? Without doubt. So this is an MD5 hash where that is just simply a type 7 um, non MD5. It's more like a Vignier cipher uh, where it's very, very simple to crack. And again, Cisco has been very clear that the type 7 passwords, and you can see that's what that number there represents, that the type 7 passwords, they're not meant to keep out the wiliest of hackers, right? It's meant to protect you from the shoulder surfer, the individual that may be looking over your shoulder, uh, you know, ever so briefly, so that they don't see oh, the password is let me in. They see this, and that's probably going to be a little more difficult to remember, right? Again, protecting you against the shoulder surfer, not against the wily hacker. Now, I'm going to have, there's going to be a bunch of segues here, and I'm going to kind of go off script in a number of areas because I want to make sure that we comprehensively cover a lot of the things that you're going to need to know, not just for this activity, but in general, when you're out there in the real world. So we've got this non-service password encryption that we see here. We see what it looks like with service password encryption. We see what the enable password looks like when we say secret. Now, remember, I said that when we typed in that secret keyword with the username admin command, that that is a quote-unquote better practice. 
However, I'm sorry, with the enable secret as well as this username here. However, the Cisco best practice and what is recommended and what you should be looking to do is the following. So I'm on a 3750 switch here, right? It's completely wiped clean. So if I was to go from user exec to privilege exec into global config and say username admin and do a question mark, you can see that we have far more options here. Here's the secret option. Here's the password option. Now, this is an older version of code. If I come to a router that I know has a newer version of code, in fact, this router is running 15.6.3, so extremely recent code. And if I went into global config, and again, this would work on a router with recent, more recent code or a switch with more recent code. If I were to say username admin and do the question mark, we're looking for that right there, the algorithm type. Because MD5 has been compromised and it is unsecure, right? We know that the type 7 passwords are extremely unsecure because it's literally uh, a it's an elementary activity to get a type seven password, cut and paste it into a web page. Cracking MD5 is gonna be a little more difficult, but this is how you avoid both of those scenarios. And this is the recommended best practice. If you go on to take the, and give me a second here, I'll go a rhythm type. If you go on to take the CCNA security courses, you'll see that they talk about this a lot. What algorithm type should you use to hash that this password we're gonna put in for the user admin? And you can see there's MD5, not recommended. There's script and SHA-256. The recommendation is script. And let me show you what this looks like. So we'll say script, secret. Now here, when I say secret, it's not MD5, right? Because the algorithm type is script. And so let me put let me in. And we're going to use that as the password. And here's what that looks like. Do show run include username. And I misspelled username. So take a look and you can see that is a type 9 password. And this is the best practice recommendation. And it doesn't take too long to look at that and figure out that that is going to be a far more difficult task than when we're looking at this type 5. You can see how much longer the type 9 is. That is the best practice. That's what you should be looking for and looking to use. Unfortunately, here, remember, Packet Tracer username admin question mark, Packet Tracer is an extremely trimmed down version of iOS. It's going to allow us to perform the activities that are required as part of the curriculum for the CCNA and specifically for the Cisco Networking Academy curriculum at the CCNA level. Packet Tracer is not used at the CCMP level. If you move on, Packet Tracer is not going to assist you in a lot of the more complex things you're gonna to need to do at the NP level. It's a CCNA tool. So here you can see that it's very trimmed down. So we've got our username added in there. Uh, and again, we've got that password. Now it says crypto key length of 1024. Well, this is pretty straightforward. Crypto key generate RSA modulus, and it's gonna prompt me. So here you can see packet tracer prompts you for what to put in. If I come back to our router and I say crypto key generate RSA, you can see that I can actually put in modulus and then specify right here on the command line 2048 and hit, oh, I don't have a domain name, so we would say IP domain name cisco.com. Whoops, and we want cisco.com. And then we rerun that command and it's going to go ahead, it's going to generate the keys. Packet Tracer is going to ask you to hit enter here. It's not going to allow you to put the whole thing in. And so we'll go ahead and say 1024 because that is going to be good enough uh, to allow us to enable SSH version 2, which this activity is 
definitely going to ask us to do. All right, so the keys have been generated with that crypto key generate RSA command, and you can see it says SSH5 enabled, SSH1.9.9 has been enabled. Well, we want to make sure uh, that we're running a secure version of SSH. And so the very next thing it asks us to do, right, is to set some limitations on the secure shell configuration here on the router. So it says use SSH version 2. So IP SSH version 2. In fact, if I said IP SSH question mark, you can see it kind of kind of helps us here that we're not looking at 50 different options because we can see that it says limited to two authentication attempts. Okay, so IP SSH authentication retries two, and then IP SSH uh, timeout is going to be 60. And that's going to get us a few points. And now we're at seven out of 75 on the SSH configuration. Now, plain text password should be encrypted. That is our service password encryption command that we already ran to take a look at the differences in the type 5 password, the type 7 password, and we'll call it the type 0, the unencrypted password, which basically shows us the password in plain text. All right, uh, the next thing it's asking us to do, and it hasn't talked about remote access yet, and I'm wondering if that, yeah, rem okay, so I saw that down here in the bottom, the verify remote access. So we're going to have to verify remote access. Well, in order to have remote access, we need to configure that on the VTY lines. So I'm going to go to line VTY 0 through 15, and I'm going to say login local. And what that means, that login local, it means to use the local triple A database. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, whoa, triple A, I haven't heard that term before. Well, that's for authentication, authorization, and accounting. And while we don't say triple A here, that is what it's using. It's the local triple A database. In other words, when I were to say, if I were to say show run, and we see this username here, that is the local database. It's the database local to this hardware component. In other words, there is no centralized repository where a user can log on to any of the components. Let's say you've got 100 components in your environment, and they all contact a central login authentication server. That is different than what we're doing here. This, and what we do on each of these two devices we're going to be configuring, is we're using the local authentication, authorization, and accounting database that is located locally on the device. And so I say login local. Now, they've had us configure, and again, so here's where it kind of becomes implied, right? It says verify remote access. But it doesn't tell me to configure remote access. I'm looking up here. It doesn't say anything about that. But it's implied that if I'm going to limit the authentication attempts, and we're going to have a 60-second timeout, and I've got SSH version 2 configured, that I'm that what I just did right here in this step right here is I'm preparing the switch for remote access. And so again, it's implied because when you get down to the end of the activity, if you didn't do this, you would probably see that you're going to be missing some points because again, you've got to be uh, crafty enough to take a look at those requirements, right? The requirement of configuring SSH version 2, the requirement of limiting it to two authentication attempts. In other words, if I don't type the password improperly two times, I've got a 60 second timeout that I'm going to be looking at uh, on those failures, right? And, and I'll simulate that. So those requirements right there tell me that, yeah, I've got to allow remote access. So if I say do show run and we come down to the very end here, you can see that these VTY lines, right? Before I type login local, there was nothing there. And so now let me go ahead and say transport input. And this is very important as well. What kind of 
remote access do I want to allow into those virtual terminal lines from remote nodes? Now, I could say all, none, SSH, or Telnet. So, just like we use the service password encryption for the shoulder surfers, right, and that's, that's a decent practice, we use MD5 to encrypt those passwords. That's a better practice, but the best practice is transport input SSH by itself, right? Do not use Telnet. And the reason that you don't want to use Telnet is because the Telnet traffic, including your password that you're entering in for that remote session, is passed in clear text. With SSH, that is not the case. All right, so we've got the remote access configured. Now let's drop down here to configure name and assign VLANs. Ports should be manually configured as access ports. So let me work, let's work our way back here towards the top of the activity. And again, the VLAN component here, very straightforward, very simple. So let's go ahead and say VLAN 15, name, servers. VLAN 30, name, PCs. VLAN 45, name, native, whoops, and let's reach, change that name there, native, and then VLAN 60, name, management. And so we're, what we're doing is we are carving up this physical switch into multiple, whoops, sorry, virtual switches, so to speak, right? And let me see if I can, where I can move this to here where we can see the switch. So I'm basically carving that switch up into multiple, multiple virtual broadcast domain slash subnets. Think of it like this. A VLAN is a subnet, is a broadcast domain. And so we're taking this physical switch and it's physical appears to be what, 24, 26 ports, right? So the 24 fast ethernet ports and then the two gig ports. And we're going to carve it into little virtual switches inside of the physical switch. And we do that, right? This layer two segmentation technology is called a VLAN. And again, it's layer two. If we wanted to do this on the router at layer three, and this is way outside the scope of CCNA, it may be mentioned in the Connecting Networks course, uh, but what we would use is a VRF, or a virtual routing and forwarding instance. And so the VLAN is a layer two construct. Very important to remember that. The VRF is the layer three construct. So at layer two, we're dealing with the VLANs. We're going to use, I'm sorry, at layer two, we're dealing with a... Um, a VLAN, so we create multiple VLANs. At layer three, you would create VRFs if you wanted to segment those uh, instances. All right, so we've got the VLANs created. So if I say do show VLAN brief, right, you can see that the VLANs have been created. And this is great. And again, I'm going to move back and forth because I want to make sure that there are no surprises when we're working on the hardware in class, our 3560v2s and our 2960s. So you'll notice I'm still in the global config VLAN subconfiguration mode. And again, that's great. And I can see those VLANs. Now, in the real world, how exactly does that work? So here I am back on this 3750 switch, and we're running 12.5 or 12.255 SE 10 code. Now, this is a very old version of code. The 3750, not a recent model of switch, but this is common uh, behavior that you're going to see. So I'm going to say VLAN 10, and I think it was, or 15 was servers. Whoops, sorry. We'll say name servers, and we'll just create some VLANs here. VLAN 30. We'll say name students, VLAN 45, name native. So we're mimicking what we did in Packet Tracer. So if I say do show VLAN brief, 
right? You can see I see 10 servers, 30 students, but where's 45? It's not there. What if I say VLAN 60, name management, and then do show VLAN brief? So I see 45, but I don't see 60. So you'll notice I'm not seeing, even if I run that command again, I'm not seeing the last VLAN that I entered. But what if I type end and then say show VLAN brief? Now we do see it. You'll notice it dropped it here on the bottom. And let me make sure I didn't miss. Yeah, you'll notice it wasn't there until we exited out. And on some versions of iOS, there'll be instances where you're configuring VLANs and you'll say do show VLAN brief and you'll see nothing. You'll see none of the VLANs that you had just created. You need to exit out of that VLAN sub configuration mode in order to see things. And we just saw sort of a similar behavior on the 3750 here where we would create the VLAN and it wasn't until we either created this next VLAN or exited out of the VLAN config that we were able to see the VLANs in that show VLAN brief. So be aware of that, that you need to make sure you exit out of that VLAN configuration sub mode in order to see what you've configured. Okay, so we've configured our VLANs, we've named our VLANs. Now we are going to, says ports should be manually configured as access ports. Now, pay very close attention to this, which port should be the access ports? Because you'll notice, again, we sort of get this implied configured trunking, but it's not telling me which port should be the trunk port. Again, you should know this from your previous two courses, networking one and two, by looking at the diagram and being able to decipher, oh, well, we're doing router on a stick here, so I think I'm pretty sure I know which port it's supposed to be. In fact, you can tell that the way that we're doing our inter-VLAN routing is via router on a stick, right? We get a single connection. We're going to create sub-interfaces on the router. The switch side, that is going to be the trunk port. Because again, remember, we're going to be allowing multiple VLANs, multiple different VLANs, in our case 15, 30, 45, 60, to traverse the trunk link to get to the router so that we have connectivity and we can do inter VLAN routing. So let's step back a second here. So again, which port should be the access ports? Well, it's going to be these ports here. Fast Ethernet 011 to 020 and 01 to 010. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to put it into the correct VLAN at the same time. So I'm going to say interface range. And we want to use a range because this is going to make it much easier. Imagine having to go in to these 20 ports one by one. It would take forever. So what do we do to make it an access port? So we say switch port mode access, right? And that makes it an access port. Now, for FA011 to 020, I'm going to say switch port, access, VLAN. And what VLAN should these be in? Well, they should be in VLAN 15. Now, there's a couple commands that I haven't run that I don't know. And I think maybe they do when we get to the security. Let me see here. OK, so they talk about port security and disabling things. So here's what I'm going to do, right? Again. This is a best, oh, I shouldn't say it's a, well, I guess it, you know, it is a best practice from a security standpoint. These are access ports. So in other words, no one should be allowed to plug a switch into an access port. So what I want to say is switch, oh, not port security, sorry, uh, switch port spanning tree, or actually we just want to do spanning tree, my bad. Spanning tree, port fast, and we are going to enable port fast on here. And this is going to be a little different. What is it? BPDU. They want you to put it right here. BPDU guard. Okay, there we go. So BPDU guard out of the spanning tree toolkit, 
right? And what does BPDU guard do? Well, remember, if we connect two switches together, those switches will send each other bridge protocol data units, right, or BPDUs. And that is something that's unique between switches. In other words, there's no reason on any of these ports, fast Ethernet 011 to 020, there's no reason to have another switch plugged in. In fact, if somebody, let's say you've got a bad actor at your company, and he decides at his desk in that into the jack that connects back to the switch in your closet, that he's going to connect another switch in because he wants to plug his personal PC into your network. You definitely don't want that, right? So BPDU Guard is going to do one thing and one thing only, and it does it very, very well. It's going to shut down any port on which we enable BPDU Guard immediately upon reception of a BPDU. Because if it's receiving a BPDU on one of these ports, what does that tell the switch immediately? Yeah, hey, somebody else, just somebody, plugged a switch into me into an access port that is not supposed to have a switch plugged in. So as an administrator, you want to ensure that that port shuts down. Because then that individual is going to have to come to you and say, yeah, hey, um, so at my desk, um, I, I don't have connectivity anymore. And hopefully your solar winds, you know, your network management software has alerted you in some form or fashion that the port was shut down. And that's when you can say, yeah, so it's interesting, you know, you're not supposed to be plugging in your Linksys switch into the corporate network. And then they say, oh, sorry, I didn't know. My bad, right? But again, this prevents what could be a very, very disruptive event like a broadcast storm of some kind. Maybe this individual was going to try to hack your network with his personal PC because he's got all of his hacking tools loaded on there. So again, BPDU Guard Enable is definitely something you want to do. And also, when we talk about spanning tree, port fast. And what that means is that when we connect a node, so in other words, if I were to take this staff PC and plug it in here to the switch and port fast is enabled, it's going to skip the spanning tree listening and learning states, and it's going to transition immediately to the forwarding state. In other words, it's gonna, the port's going to come up immediately. I'm going to be able to forward traffic immediately, where the default behavior with spanning tree, and again, depending on the version of spanning tree you're running, that's going to dictate how long you sit in the spanning tree states. But with the default per VLAN spanning tree that Cisco runs, you're going to be looking at the listening state and then the learning state. And then you're going to transition to the forwarding state. You're looking at about 45 to 60 seconds, right? Best case scenario. So we don't need that, right? What you need that for is when you're plugging another switch into, when you're plugging switches together, you're interconnecting switches, then you want it to go through the listening and learning because, again, those BPDUs are carrying that very important switch information. Hey, this is my bridge priority. Maybe I'm going to be the root bridge, right? And then spanning tree needs to converge between the switches using those BPDUs. But if you're plugging a PC in or you're plugging in a file server, do I need to sit in the listening and learning states? No, I want to be forwarding traffic immediately. And that is what PortFast is going to accomplish. Now, you'll notice we didn't get any points for that in the completion percentage. And this is a sidebar conversation. That is a best practice. That's what you should be doing for your access ports. Need to make sure I stress that. Access ports, right? Not a trunk port that's going to be connected to another switch. You would never want to do port fast, and you would never want to do BPDU guard. Right? Well, I shouldn't say never, but you would not do that, right? You would not do that because as soon as it receives a BPDU, it's going to shut it down. Maybe there's a corner case somewhere where you're going to enable BPDU guard between switches. I've never seen that, and to be honest with you, I think we can safely say you would never do that. You want it to go through the listening and learning states. It's the same thing with port fast, right? So BPDU guard and port fast on your access ports. So let's go into interface range. 
and we're going to say FA01 to 10. And again, switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN 30. And then we're going to say spanning tree BPDU guard enable, and then spanning tree port fast. And we see this warning here telling us, and again, I kind of skipped over this initially, but look, connecting hubs, concentrators, switches, bridges, et cetera, to this interface when port fast is enabled can cause temporary bridging loops. Use with caution. So again, that's why we want BPDU guard on. Because as soon as it gets a BPDU on any of these ports that are not supposed to be getting BPDUs, it's going to shut that port down. All right, so let's go ahead and say, uh, and let me check. I think they were all uh, no shut by default. So let's say do show run, and let's look at our ports. So that's what our ports should look like, right? Very, very straightforward. For the first 20 ports, we've got them in the proper VLANs, but now we're kind of left with this other group of ports here, right? Fast Ethernet 0, 21 to 24, and then Gig 01 and 02. So what did it say? It said ports should be manually configured as access ports, but then it says configure port, or I'm sorry, configure trunking. Well, when we look at this diagram here, if I mouse over the red dot, typically it would come up with the interface, right? If you mouse over, usually you'll see the interface. Here, that's not happening. So we've got to play sort of a little guessing game here. One of these ports on this switch, it's either Fast Ethernet 0, 21 to 24, or one of the gig ports. One of those six ports that's left over that we haven't configured yet is going to be that trunk port right there. So let's go ahead Whoops, we don't want to do that. Let's go ahead and bring our switch back, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to sort of do process of elimination here. And you'll notice I moved it up just ever so slightly so that I can see that red dot. So here's what we're going to do, because one of these ports is going to be a trunk port, and we're going to take a guess. Do you think it would be the fast Ethernet ports, one of those fast Ethernet ports? While it certainly could be, remember that it's probably not going to be. And here's why it wouldn't be one of those four ports. Because we just configured on that switch 20 fast Ethernet ports, which is 100 megabits a second, right? So I could possibly have at some point in my network 20 things connected into the, I don't know if this is 20, I'm just putting a bunch of things here. 20 nodes connected into the switch, each capable of sending theoretically up to 100, whoops, sorry, megabits per second, right? 100 megabits per second. Now, if that is all going out a single link to my router and I make this 100 megabits per second, is that a smart thing to do? No, because at this point, I'm oversubscribed by a ratio of 20 to 1, right? That's sort of the oversubscription is I've got 20 hosts sitting back here that could all theoretically be sending the maximum amount of throughput at the same time. It's going to flood that link because it's only capable of servicing one of these hosts at its maximum transmit speed. So we want to make sure it's not going to happen that way. So chances are it's going to be, it's got to be one of these two ports here. Because gig E is a thousand megabits a second. And let me pick another color here. That's a thousand megabits per second. So from the architectural perspective, that is the choice we want. Because if that is my choice, right, and that's an option, and it clearly is here with a gig port, then how many hosts could I have back here before oversubscription became a problem? Exactly. I could have 100 hosts running or plugged into 100 fast Ethernet ports at 100 megabits per second. And it's not until we get here that we would theoretically, and again, these are theoretical numbers, Remember TCP, you're never going to get 100 megabits a second. 
it's going to be probably 75 to 80 percent of the 100 megabits, and that is best case scenario. So again, we're saying theoretically, I could put 100 hosts back there, and then I would be at a one-to-one -one ratio on that link in terms of hosts to throughput or available bandwidth, right? So keep that in mind. And again, this is one of those things that they're expecting you to know sort of based off the two pre the previous two courses. So let's go into Interface Gig01, and I'm going to say no shut. And the question is, does that change the status of my link there? And it doesn't look like it does. So let's go into Interface Gigabit02. And that link should either go orange, and it could be that we're shut down on the router side. So here's what I'm going to do. So when we take a look at the router here, right, which port do you think is being used for the inter-VLAN routing router on a stick configuration? Yeah, it's pretty obvious. It's gig zero, zero. So I'm going to go to the router side here, and real quickly, and interesting, the router is is uh, the router CLI text is actually larger. So maybe it's just the switch that's having the issue. So let's go into privilege exec, let's go into global config, interface gig zero, zero, and I'm just gonna say no shut here. Aha, so that was it. So the link was shut down and it was tough to see there because this address block is covering the router side. So we bring the interface up on the router and now you can see, why is it orange? Why is it blinking orange? And how long do you think we're going to have to sit here and wait? I'm going to give you a second to think about that. We just talked about it a few moments ago. Exactly. The light is blinking orange and there it just flipped green. But it was blinking orange and it was probably, I guess, close to 30 seconds or so maybe. And that's because when we brought these, we already brought the switch interface up, and we're going to figure out which one it is right now, because I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say, I'm in, uh, or actually, okay, good. So you can see here, it's interface gig01. So what can we do? I can say, shut on gig02, because we're not using gig02. But back to that orange flashing. It's flashing because here on the switch, we never said spanning tree port fast on this port. So when the port came up physically, right, the layer one and layer two come up, that is when the switch port comes up, and that is when spanning tree says, uh, 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 hold on, we're not forwarding just yet. We're going to go through the listening stage because I'm listening for BPDUs. Right? We're going to go through the learning stage because I'm going to start learning about who my neighbor switches are. And then we're going to transition to the forwarding state because as a switch, I need to listen for those BPDUs. I need to learn about those different bridge priorities that may be out there from my other neighbor switches. And, only, and then and only then am I going to transition into the forwarding state witnessed by the little light here flickering and turning green, right? Very very important. Okay, so Gig02 is not being used, it's Gig01. So let's get back into interface Gigabit Ethernet 01. And we already said no shut, but let's go ahead and we want to hard code this port. And so let me pull this down now. We don't necessarily need to see uh, the green light anymore. If I was to say do show interface Gigabit 01 switch port, right? You can see here, and let's take a look. And this command, if, you, if there's no other command that you memorize in this course, make sure it is this one, especially when we go to talk about spanning tree and the different states that the ports are set to. You can see here the switch port is enabled. The administrative mode is dynamic auto. And we talk about this in the upcoming, we talk about this next week, next Tuesday, we're going to be discussing dynamic auto, dynamic desirable, the dynamic trunking protocol. We're going to be looking at that switch port no negotiate command. And we're going to see uh, 
how we can manipulate that. Now, that's the administrative mode. What is the operational mode? The operational mode is static access. In other words, this port right now is functioning as an access port. And again, this is a critical, critical concept that becomes very confusing for learners when talking about the output of this do show interface GIGO1 switch port command. And again, I could substitute any of the interfaces uh, on the switch in this output here. But here is the point. Administratively, and again, that's the default setting for this model of switch, dynamic auto. And this is the dynamic trunking protocol in action. And so here's what happens on the switch. So here's my switch. And I'm going to say we've got node X. And I plug node X in. And let's say that this is gig 01. When I plug node X into gig 01 here on this switch, if and only if the dynamic trunking protocol is running, and it is, it's on by default on Cisco switches. So by default, when I plug something into that gig 01 port, here's what's going to happen. The switch is first going to try to negotiate with the, with the node on the other end. And again, I have node X here. This could be a switch. It could be a router. It could be our PC. But irrespective of what kind of node we plug in, the dynamic trunking protocol is going to attempt to negotiate what kind of port is this going to be. Is it going to use encapsul or what kind of encapsulation mode and what kind of port is it going to be? Is it going to use the encapsulation of dot one Q? It will try to negotiate that. It will then try to negotiate and say, are we going to be using ISL, which is Cisco's proprietary secret sauce? On newer Cisco switches, that is not even an option because nobody is using ISL, right? No one's using ISL. It's Cisco proprietary. This is the open standard, 802.1Q. So it's going to try to negotiate. Uh, and actually, I think the order is it tries to negotiate ISL first. So we'll say first. Then it tries to negotiate 802.1Q second. And then if it can't negotiate dot one Q with the node over here, and it can't negotiate ISL with the node over here, it falls back to static access mode. Which is why when you take a, if you were to take a brand new Cisco switch out of the box, and you were to plug in PCs, and all those PCs were on the same subnet. In other words, they were addressed 192.168.1.2.3.4.5. They would all be able to speak to each other. Because even though dynamic trunking protocol is on, and by default, all the ports on a switch are trunk ports by default, dynamic trunking protocol will negotiate with whatever is plugged in to see, hey, are you a switch? And if you're a switch, you want to speak ISL with me as the encapsulation method? Do we want to do 802.1Q? And then you know what? What if it's not a switch? What if it's the PC that got plugged in? The PC is not going to talk 802.1Q. It's certainly not going to talk ISL. Okay, the switch says, well, then you must be an access node. So I'm going to make myself an access port. And that is what you see right there. Static access. OK, and so that is how the switch is doing that. And this is what becomes confusing is learners look at this and they say, oh, it's dot one Q, right? Negotiation of trunking is on. It's a trunk port. And then they become confused because they don't understand how is it that the PCs can talk to each other if they're trunk ports? It's that they are not. They're access ports and DTP facilitates that. And here, let me prove to you that that is the case. If I were to say, remember, we can run that switch show switch port command. Let's pull this back here and let's say switch port fast ethernet zero one. 
because that is a, a, a statically hard-coded access port. And let's see if anything is different between this output. So look at the administrative mode. Static access. What was the administrative mode here? Right? What's the default, in other words? Right? So we changed it. We statically configured it as an access. The operational mode. This got negotiated. DTP basically said, ah, you don't want to talk ISL. You don't want to talk 802.1Q. Eh, I guess I'll, I'm an access port then. Same thing here, right? Except it's statically configured. The administrator statically configured it. Now, interesting. Look here. Administrative trunking encapsulation. Again, what is the default? It's not that it's trunking, and it's not that it's trunking with 802.1Q. It's that this is the default. And then native, I'm sorry, the operational trunking encapsulation is native. And here you go right here, negotiation of trunking off. Now, we'll come back to this next, I'm going to leave this out there for next week. Uh, but just know that you may not see that on the real hardware, right? You may not see that on the real hardware, and we'll come back to that. But very, very critical to understand the output of that command. So let's go ahead now, and let's step back here. Whoops, we'll step back here and move on in the activity. And let me get a little more real estate here. So we want to configure that port as a trunk port, because right now it is not a trunk port. We saw that it is operating as an access port. So how do we make a trunk port? We say switch port mode trunk, right? And you can see the interface went down and then it came back up. Now, it's not asking us to do this, but another good practice, what about this? Switch port trunk VLAN, or allowed VLAN, sorry allowed VLAN, we want to limit the VLANs that are coming across this trunk port, right? I don't want to leave it open to all 4,096, right? I want to go ahead, I want to scope it down. And I know that we're going to be using VLAN 15. I know we're going to be using VLAN 30, 45, and 60. And you're probably looking at that saying, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second, wait a second. What about VLAN 1? Don't we have to allow VLAN 1? If I don't do VLAN 1, what happens? Well, nothing's going to happen. Any control plane traffic that utilizes or needed to, would need to utilize VLAN 1 is still going to utilize VLAN 1, right? You cannot prune the control traffic on VLAN 1 off of a trunk link. So I'm limiting it to the VLANs we want to use, 15, 30, 45, and 60, and we know that the link is up. So that's our trunk configuration. We got the points for that. Uh, let's implement port security. So on Fast Ethernet 01, let's get into interface Fast Ethernet 01. We're going to turn on port security. Now, remember, you have to say switch port, port security by itself to enable port security on a port. Now, if I say do show run, and we'll go up to Fast Ethernet 01, that's what it looks like right now. But we're going to add some things in here. So I'm going to say switch port, port security maximum, whoops, maximum, and this is the maximum number of MAC addresses that are allowed. So it's asking us to allow two. If I didn't type this command in, switch port, port security, maximum two, only a single MAC address is allowed. That's the default. And that's also one of those tricky Cisco things is we don't see that in this output. So if I were to ask you, based off what's highlighted in blue here, what is the maximum number of MAC addresses allowed on this port? And if you were searching and looking for that switch port port security maximum output, it's not going to be there. Because by default, it is a single MAC address. And it's not in the running config. You're not going to see it here. So we say switch port port security maximum 2 that we would now see, because that is not the default because that is not the default all right so let's go ahead and i'm lost my spot here okay that are automatically to the added to the configuration when detected so it's more than just saying switch port port security right 
It's switch port port security. Then we're going to limit it to two. And then I'm going to say switch port port security MAC address. And this MAC address sticky. This is what adds, right? This is what's going to add automagically the MAC addresses that do show up on this port, however, we, however many we've allowed. It's going to allow them to be added to the running config. And then if I was to say, uh, do write memory and save my config or do uh, copy running config, startup config, right? That's going to save that in the running config and so or in the startup config. So if I was to reload, those MAC addresses would remain in the configuration in what would be the running config. Now, most importantly here, the switch port port security violation. You'll notice that we didn't see, it doesn't say anything about the violation up here. And that is because there's a default step. And that default step is to shut the port down, right? And so shutdown would be the default. But what are we being asked to do here? It says the port should not be disabled or shut down, but a syslog message should be captured. Well, if it's not shut down, it's either protect or restrict. And that is the significant difference between protect and restrict, is restrict is going to send the syslog message, where protect is not going to do that. Now it says disable all other unused ports. Well, how do I see all other unused ports? Well, quite simply, if I was to say do show IP interface brief, and we do show IP interface brief. Sorry, I left the IP out. And you can see here that we've got all these ports uh, that are listed here. Uh, we know that we're not using 21 to 24 and gig 2 So let's shut these guys down. So interface range FA0 slash 21 to 24 comma gigabit ethernet 02. And that puts us in that range of ports. So now when I say, not switch port, sorry about that. When I say shut down all of those ports and gig 02 was already shut down. So we didn't need to add that, but I threw it in there just so you could see the range command. Now shutting it down is good, right? That's good, but it's not good enough. So we're going to add this in again, probably not going to get points for it, but here's what you want to do. VLAN 999, right? I'm sorry, not VLAN 999. So VLAN 999. So I'm going to create VLAN 999. That, that was not my intention. I was going to say switch port uh, access VLAN 999. But we're going to say name. I'm going to create this new VLAN called parking underscore lot. And so that range command, we're going to pull that range command back, and I'm going to say switch port VLAN access, or switch port access, VLAN 999, right? And what I can do if I go into VLAN 999, uh, and it's not here, is what you can do is you can shut down that VLAN. So that if for whatever reason someone was able to physically connect into any of those ports, not only would it be shut down, or not only would the port be shut down, but if the port was not shut down, it would be in a VLAN that doesn't have connectivity to anything else we're using here. So we're not using VLAN 999 for anything. And that's why we put it in that parking lot VLAN, right? So think about that. Put those unused shutdown ports into a VLAN that is not being used and that cannot communicate with anything else. All right, so we disabled all other ports. So now we get into the HQ router config, and this is going to be a very welcome change here because the router is cooperating with us in terms of our request to make the text a little larger here. And I did test this on a totally different Mac and a Windows platform, and the switch just does not cooperate. All right, so configure inter VLAN routing. And again, that's one of these implied statements where it's like, okay, I need to know that I'm doing router on a stick and that's how I'm gonna do things here. So let's get that configured. So I'm gonna get into interface gigabit ethernet 00 dot 15. I'm doing a sub interface. Now, one of the most common mistakes, and I, I today still make this mistake when I'm you know rushing through things and I'm using sub interfaces or creating a sub interface. The 
immediate inclination, right, or the immediate desire is to say, okay, I'm going to look up there and say it's IP address 10.10.10.161, and it's a 255, 255, 255, 224 subnet mask, right? A slash 27, and I hit enter. And then I'm like, wait a minute, why am I getting this? So again, this is one of the most common mistakes. Remember, when you're dealing with sub-interfaces on the router, and here's really what we're talking about. So here's the router, and here's my switch. And here is that single link, that trunk port, that comes into that single interface right here, gig zero, zero. And think of it like this. A trunk port on a switch will send multiple VLANs. So it's going to send VLAN 15. And then let me change colors here. Hang with me. And then it's going to send, and actually orange is a little too close to red. And then it's going to send VLAN 30, and yellow is almost impossible to see. Not good color choices so far. And then it's going to send VLAN 45 native VLAN traffic. And then it's going to send, and we'll use blue, it's going to send VLAN 60 traffic for the management VLAN. So let me ask you this. When all of this traffic from all of these VLANs here shows up on that port, how does the router have any clue as to which traffic should be treated by which sub-interface or which traffic goes to which sub-interface? How does the router know that? Well, the only way that the router is going to know that is if we encapsulate, right, set the encapsulation using 802.1Q on the sub-interface. Now, here's something very, very important. That convention right there, this, or I should say over here, when I said interface gig 00 .15, why did I use 15? Exactly, because it corresponds to the VLAN number. And that incap.1q15 command that I'm getting ready to run down here, right, that 15 at the end, that is the VLAN number. But it's very important to understand that this does not have to match the VLAN number. I could have said int, whoops, interface gigabit 00 dot 73. And then I can come in here and I can say incap dot 1q 15. And it's going to work, right? But here's what's going to happen. A month from now, you're going to be troubleshooting something. And you're going to come in here and you're going to say, Gig 0073, God, what VLAN does that go to? You're going to have no idea. So best practice, always, 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 when you create that sub-interface, tie it to the VLAN number when you're doing router on a stick. Because if you need to go back and look, I can look at that and say right away, oh, yeah, VLAN 15, boom. It's the server's VLAN. That's the sub-interface. VLAN 60, management, right? VLAN 30, yeah, I know VLAN 30 is the PCs. VLAN 45, yeah, that's my native VLAN. It's much easier to create sub-interfaces that correspond to the VLAN numbers, even though you don't have to, and even though it would work. It is a terrible, terrible idea to not make them correspond to that VLAN number for the sub-interface number. Make those things match, right? But what does have to match is my incap.1q number has to match the VLAN number because that is how the traffic is being encapsulated with the VLAN tag so that when it shows up at the router interface, the router can differentiate all of the traffic coming across that physical link and then place it with the correct sub-interface based off that 802.1q VLAN tag. So very, very important sidebar conversation there. Okay, so 
That's the most common mistake is that people forget to say in cap dot one Q. And remember, this is that 802.1Q VLAN tag. So it has to match the VLAN number coming across that trunk port, right? The VLAN that we have that sits behind the switch. These have to match. The subinterface number does not, but it is a terrible idea not to match the subinterface number. So now we can add the IP address in here. All right, so now let's get into interface gigabit ethernet 00 .30, the next sub interface. So again, the first thing in cap dot one Q has to match the VLAN number behind the switch or on the switch, right? Now I can put my IP address and the IP address here is 10.10.10.193. And this is 255, sorry, 255.255.255.192, a slash 26. Right, so we had a slash 27, right? That's the CIDR notation, that classless interdomain routing notation. We've got a slash 26, right? So we've definitely subnetted that 10.10.10.0 slash 24 network down into more appropriate blocks. Uh, and interface gigabit ethernet 0, 0 0.45 and in cap dot one Q 45. And we're going to say uh, IP address 10.10.10.129. And this is a slash 28, 240, 255.255.245.240. Make sure I got that right. Yep. And then interface gigabit ethernet 00.60. In cap dot one q sixty that VLAN tag right that's this sub interface is going to receive all traffic coming across the trunk port that has the VLAN tag of sixty from the management VLAN and so then we've got our IP address ten dot ten dot ten dot what are we using up there one forty five and this is also a slash twenty eight two fifty five two fifty five two fifty five two forty is that right? Let me make sure I got that right. Okay, that's correct. All right, and as you can see, our points have kind of been adding up there. Now we'll come back, we'll roll back down here. So configure DHCP services for VLAN 30. Use LAN as the case sensitive name for the pool. So we had a great question by Andrew. He pinged me yesterday and he had everything set up and he had 74 out of 75 points. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let this roll, right? I'm going to I'm going to intentionally leave out what they implicitly want you to do here, right? Because there's a single step here that should cost us a point. So I'm going to go ahead and say IP DHCP pool. What do we say? LAN? Is that the name? Yeah, LAN. And it's case sensitive, so it needs to be all caps. So I say IP DHCP DHCP pool LAN. Now it doesn't ask me to put in any of the things that I could put in, like DNS server or default router, right? It doesn't, it's not telling me to put those in there, but it's implied that if I don't put the default router in, how is traffic that's going from VLAN 30, the PC there, going to know where to go for its default gateway? So I have to have that in there. So I'm going to say default router, and the default router would be the IP address on the sub interface for VLAN 30, right? That is my default gateway, 10.10.10.193. Is that right? Yep. So that's the default router. And then for what network am I supplying? Whoops, am I supplying DHCP addressing? Well, it's the same network up here that we see that this falls into. And here's where it can get a little tricky. Because a common mistake is to say network 10.10.10.193, but that is not the network ID, right? Remember, that is not the network ID. What would the network ID be? For a slash 26 that's going to have 62 usable IP addresses that sits in the range there. Right, it would be the address before that. And I'm going to leave the subnetting conversation out for right now in terms of working through all the subnetting. But it would be the previous address, right? Because that's the first usable IP address, not the subnet 
or the network identifier. So the network identifier would be 10101092 with that slash 255, 255, 255, and it is a 192. With that slash 26 dotted decimal notation subnet mask. That is going to ensure that nodes on that network receive an IP. And I'm going to leave the piece out here. It's going to ask us to validate this. I saw this earlier. Where is it at? Verify complete routing table. Okay. It does. Oh, here it is right here. Verify the staff has received full addressing information from the HQ router. So I'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And we'll see what happens. We'll watch the router at the same time and see what happens. So uh, there you go. I've got my DHCP configured. Now, if I did have a DNS server, right? Let's say we're using Google. 8.8.8.8, right? So we can put that in there. So here's what this looks like. So we say do show run. And there's my DHCP pool. Okay? So let's move on. Knowing that we're probably leaving something important out here. Configure one network statement for the entire, I'm sorry, where do we go? Okay, implement routing. So using RIP v2, I'm a little shocked that we're using RIP v2. Uh, but again, in a small network, hey, RIP is a viable solution. Uh, I would have liked to have seen OSPF here because that's covered in the uh, routing and switching essentials course. So it would have been nice to see OSPF uh, far more common than RIP v2. But let's go ahead and say router RIP. Now, once I type router rip, you can see we've got all kinds of different things that we can add in here. Well, it says use rip version 2. So I'm going to say version because by default it is not. Excuse me. It would be version 1, and we don't want that. Rip version 1 is mega legacy. Uh, it is also not a uh, classless. Uh, routing pro is class full, right? So we can't do variable link subnet masking. So we want version two of RIP. It says configure one network statement for that entire 10.10.10.0 10 uh, slash 24 network. So there we go. So what that means is that any interface, and I'm, I apologize, I left out the 255, 255, 255.0. Actually, we don't need that. It, what that means is that any interface in the 10, 10, 10 network, and if I was to say do show run, and I can't trim it down, unfortunately, we're going to have to go hunt for the RIP setup here. Uh, what that means is any interface in that network is going to be running uh, the RIP protocol. Now, you'll notice what did RIP v2 do here? Is that the 10, 10, 10, 0 slash 24? No, it's not. And full disclosure here, this is what I like to call a fortuitous failure, right? Is I typed that in and I left something out that I should have put in here before. And what should I have said before I did any of that? Before I typed the network command in, what should I have done? Yeah, what did it do here? It did auto summarization for me. But I don't want it to do auto summarization because now I'm saying, you know, start sending out RIP messages on any interface that's in the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 network. What I should have said was no auto summary. And this is how often I work with RIP. So again, network should be 10.10.10.0. And now when we say do show run, what we should see, and it looks like it's going to leave it in there as a 10.0.0.0 with the no auto summary. Let me do this. Let me see if it was the no network 10.0.0.0. And then let me say network 10.10.10.0. And we should be looking for, we should see that do show run because we don't want it to auto summarize. So it looks like it's going to do the auto summary anyway. And let me check. I've got to look, I'm sorry, because that to me does not ring true. So let's take a look at router five here. 15.6 code, I'm going to go into global config. We're going to say router rip version two. And I'm going to say network 10.10.10.0. And I could have swore do show run 
section router rip. Okay, but if I say no auto summary, all right, let's try this again. Let's say network 10.10.10.0. No, it doesn't like that. No network 10.0.0.0. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to see if on, on real iOS, network 10.10.10.0, if it's going to display it as that. Again, I apologize. I don't use RIP too often. And so I want to see. Okay, so that is legitimate. But I still have concerns about that. So I'll leave this the way it is here and let me see what I, so it trims it down, passive interfaces, network. Yeah, okay, so it's very possible that that's how it displays it again. I can't remember off the top of my head if that is correct or not. But we've got that no auto summary command in there. However, that network statement doesn't depict and let me see, I don't think you can say, yeah, you can't say that. Okay, so we'll leave this for here right now. We'll see, maybe we need to come back to it. So disable interfaces that should not send RIP v2 messages. Well, when we take a look at this activity here, we're going to be running RIP, and we're going to run RIP here, right, on these two interfaces, but I'm not going to run RIP to the Internet. You don't run an interior gateway routing protocol, right, or an IGP. You don't run an IGP between you and a service provider. So we wouldn't be doing it on that serial interface, this 209.165.202. And we, we don't have any routers down here, right? Because I don't need to advertise RIP messages saying, hey, you know, I'm broadcasting you my information. Here's all these RIP routes. I don't need that traffic coming down here onto my LAN. In fact, that's a security concern. So all of those sub-interfaces, we're going to passive. We're going to passive the interface here to the Internet because those don't need to be running the RIP routing protocol. So do show IP interface brief. Let's take a look here. Uh, and again, even if it was the 10.0.0.0 slash 8, we're okay with that. Right, because the 10 networks are only my internal network. So let's jump into interface gigabit ethernet 00 0.15. And actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to say router rip, I apologize. And it's going to be passive interface gigabit 00 0.15, and then 30, and then 45, and then 60. And then the internet interface is going to be passive interface. Serial 010. Zero, zero. And you can see we picked up some significant points down there with those passive interface commands. So now we're at 52 out of 75. And so that is how I would passive the interfaces. And that is why you run the passive interface command for those sub interfaces, is that there are no RIP speaking routers down here. There's no RIP speaking multi layer switches, nodes, nothing. So I don't need that traffic coming down here. I don't need it going to the internet. I need it over these two serial interfaces here because these guys are my RIP partners, right? They're my RIP neighbors. Okay, so what are we going to do now? Configure a default route to the internet. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this, right? I can say, I'll exit out here, IP route with our quad zeros. And I can put in the interface. I could say serial 010. Or I could put in the IP address, and we'll do the question mark to show you what we can put in here, right? So I've got options. So I'm going to put the IP address in, and let's see, because, again, I don't know what they're looking for here. So we'll say 209.165.202. And that's got to be 139 on the other side. And I'm basing that off of the fact that we're 138, and it's a slash... 30. So there's only two usable IPs in this range. It's got to be that 130. Did we pick up the points? It, I actually didn't catch that. Let me see. Control I will say no. Yeah, 52, and there we go. So we can put the IP address in. If I didn't put the IP address in, what if I said no IP route? And what if I said IP route and I put in the interface? Now, this is totally valid here. And it's going to work. But you see that message, default route without a gateway? If not a point-to-point -point interface, may impact performance. 
And what that means, this is a point-to-point -point interface. It's a slash 30. There can only be two nodes on or in this subnet. So we're okay to do this here. Where this gets a little tricky is if you've got a, maybe a router plugged into a switch, and that switch, that port is in a VLAN, and there's other nodes in that VLAN, maybe other routers in that VLAN, maybe other switches, whatever the case may be, you're going to have to ARP out, right? And that's why it says it may impact performance. You're going to have to send an ARP, an address resolution protocol packet, to find out what outgoing interface do I need to go out. Here, it's, there's no question. I'm going out serial 010. That's the only way. And the only thing on the other end of that link is that internet router, that ISP router. So we could say it like that as well. And you'll notice it gave us the points for both methods. So both are valid. We'll leave it here with the interface. Now we get into uh, NAT, the NAT configuration. And NAT tends to trip people up uh, because it can be a little difficult in some, some ways. So configure a standard one statement ACL with the number one. Okay, so this is going to be pretty simple, right? So we're going to say access list. Doesn't get much easier than this. One. Now we say permit. And in this case, it makes good logical sense. Yeah, who do I want to permit from my inside network, my 10 dot networks? Who do I want to allow to use NAT to be able to access resources on the internet? And it tells us right here, it's that 10, 10, 10 0 slash 24 address space. So 10 dot, 10 dot, 10 dot, 0. Now, be careful here. It's a wild card mask it's looking for. So if I was to say this, that is probably the most common mistake that learners make, is they say, oh, 10, 10, 10, you see this up here, right? And you see that slash 24, and you drop this in right away. And remember, we're at 54 points right now, and I hit enter. Do we get any additional points for this? We don't, right? And if it was going to give us a point, it certainly would not give us that point. And the reason that we're not getting that point is because that is a subnet mask, not a wildcard mask. So what I really need, and actually what I really need to do is say Control A, we're going to say no, is to pull this back and to put the wildcard mask, which is the inverse of the subnet mask. That And you see, we got the two points. So it, it was going to give us points. It was going to give us two. We got those points. But again, remember, that is the most common mistake you're going to see uh, and that you're probably going to make, is to use the subnet mask and dot a decimal notation and not the inverse of the subnet mask, which is the wildcard mask. All right, so we want that wildcard mask in there, and that is what's going to get us the points. Okay. Uh, let me make sure I get this straight here. Configure standard ACL. Okay, refer to your documentation and configure static NAT for the file server. Okay, so we're going to do a static NAT statement for the file server. So let's scroll up here. And what is the file server? Oh, hold on. It'll be over here on the left. And there's the file server. So how do we do a static NAT statement for the file server? Well, I'm simply going to say IP NAT inside, right? Because this is on the inside of my network. Source static. And again, what is the inside local IP? In other words, what is that RFC 1918 private IP address? Well, it's 10.10.10.162. And that's my inside local. Now we're going to have to put the inside global. In other words, what is the publicly routable, you can see inside global IP address, what am I going to NAT it to so that when it hits the internet, the internet will route it? Because remember, those RFC 1918 addresses, uh, ISPs, your internet service providers, will not route on the public internet any of those hidden uh, addresses or those private IP addresses, those RFC 1918 addresses. So let's get this in here, 198.133.219.130. And that is the static statement that's going to be required. Now, 
I'm kind of reading this in order here, and I was wondering if they were going to ask, but they doesn't look like, are they, yeah, here they go. Configure a dynamic NAT with PAT. In other words, NAT overload or port address translation using a pool name of your choice, a slash 30 mask, and these two public addresses. And so what that means, that overload, and I'll discuss the differences between dynamic NAT and NAT overload here in just one second. So uh, we'll come in, we're going to say IP NAT, and hold on, let me make sure I get this right, the pool name of your choice. Okay, so IP NAT, and then we can, here's where we put the pool, right? So I can call it anything I want. So I'm just going to say NAT underscore pool underscore V4. That'll be my NAT pool name. Now, what's the starting address? I need to shrink this again. I apologize. I'm going to jump back and forth here. So the starting address, and let's get that real estate back, is going to be 198.133.219.128. And the ending address, which if I do a question mark, what's my ending address, is 198.133.219.128. Now, what is my network mask? Well, I have to say net mask, and it wants it in dotted decimal notation. And we know that a slash 30 is 255, 255, 255.252. And we also bumped up two points, so we know we've got the pool right. But now they kind of leave us hanging, right? And again, this is typically the step that gets overlooked, which is, all right, I've got this pool of addresses, and I've got this ACL. Where did the ACL go? The ACL is a little further up here. And I've got this ACL, right? So I've said these are the hosts that I want to allow to have access to the internet using this NAT pool. And actually, before I move on, does anybody see the air? Or I'm sorry, not the air. Does anybody see the statement that we're missing, right? So we've got the ACL, and I've got the pool that we want to allow to be used. Now what I need to add in is the IP NAT inside source list, right? I need to associate and affiliate the ACL with the pool because I need to tie those things together telling the router that if an address shows up from the 10, 10, 10, 0 slash 24, and we're doing and we're configured for NAT, then what we want to do is we want to go ahead and use these two uh, publicly routable IPs to, to perform NAT. And in our case, it's NAT overload. So List one, because that is the name or the number of the ACL that we want to use. And what's the pool I want to associate the ACL uh, with? Again, we called it NAT underscore pool underscore V4. And here's where we typically make the mistake. You'll see this mistake get made a lot. If I hit enter right now, what I'm doing is I'm doing NAT, or I'm sorry, dynamic NAT, which means I have two inside nodes will use those two addresses, and that's it. So if here's the router, here's the switch, and here's node one and node two. If I hit enter right now, what I'm saying is the first node that goes through to try to get to the internet, he's going to get that address right there. The second node that tries to get internet connectivity, he's going to get nodded out to that guy right there. So then your boss shows up and he logs in on his PC in his office and he tries to go to overstock.com to get some furniture. Not going to work. Because both dynamic NAT addresses are gone. Right? They've both been used. Because when you do a pool of addresses and you associate the ACL. It's not the ACL that dictates how many hosts are going to get to connect to the internet, right? It dictates who, but what dictates how many is the size of the NAT pool. And we've got two addresses in here. That's it. So the first two guys, right? This guy goes out to Amazon, and this guy goes out to monster.com looking for a new job. They get the two addresses. 
your boss, when he shows up, does not get the address because we're simply doing dynamic NAT. What we want to be doing is NAT overload. Right? And L-O-A-D. NAT overload. This is what we want to be doing. And in order to do that, we must put the keyword overload at the end of this statement. And what that overload keyword says is now we're doing port address translation. NAT overload is synonymous with PAT, port address translation. We're, they're the same, we're saying the same thing, right? And what that does is that is basically going to use the source and destination ports to differentiate the connect connections going out. So what we've literally done is now we have approximately 65,000 connections, unique connections can go out using that IP address, and another 65,000 can go out using that IP address, and again, this is, I'm ballparking here when I say 65,000, right? Because no, there's 65,535 ports, right? So, but I'm just ballparking approximately 65,000. So we now have about 130,000 unique conversations that can be started with port address translation. Much different than if we leave the overload keyword off. So let's make sure we don't. Let's make sure we get that in here, overload. And you'll see we end up with, we should probably end up with some points or maybe not. Okay, we get a point out of that. So that is how you do, uh, they say configure dynamic NAT with PAT. Typically I hear it referred to as NAT overload or port address translation. Because dynamic NAT is just using the pool on a first come, first serve basis. The overload keyword makes it NAT overload or PAT. Okay, so we're done with the NAT in terms of the configuration of the pool and the ACL and the static, but what do we need to do? What is still outstanding here for this activity? Exactly. I need to tell the router what interfaces are my inside interfaces and which interfaces are my outside interfaces. Well, if I was to say do show IP interface brief, we know that it's pretty straightforward. The outside interface is that internet interface, right? And we know that that's interface serial 010. And I say IP NAT outside. And you'll notice we're going to get points for every interface we do this to. So I say IP NAT outside. So what are my inside interfaces or what are the interfaces on which this router when it receives traffic, do I want it to check to see, are those guys okay to NAT? Exactly, it's gonna be that serial interface and this serial interface, and it's going to be those sub interfaces. So we're gonna get into interface serial 000, IP NAT inside, interface serial 001, and that is actually 001 right there, that extra zero is going to be ignored, but to be sure, we'll do that. IP NAT inside, interface gigabit 00 .15, IP NAT inside, interface gigabit 00 .30, IP NAT inside, and we may not need it on that native VLAN interface, but I'm going to make sure we don't miss any points here, just in case. So 0 slash 0 .45, IP NAT inside, interface gigabit Ethernet 00 .60, IP NAT inside, and that covers all of the interfaces on which uh, we would want to allow traffic to be NATed. And again, we probably don't need those two there, but I'm going to add those in just for good measure because when we're on the switch, maybe we want to see can I ping, you know, 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 the Google DNS server? Can we do that? All right, so we've got all of our NAT configuration done here. Now, staff. So verify staff has received full addressing information from HQ. And this is where I told you we know that that's, or it should not work. This was Andrew's question, uh, and this was the behavior I saw. So I'm going to pull the staff PC up. We're going to go to the desktop. I'm going to go to the IP configuration. I'm going to leave this over here, and I want to leave the router so we can see the router. So it's statically set right now. I'm gonna change it to DHCP. 
And there we go. Good. So we picked up the DHCP address, right? You can see it gave us a few points for that. So we're good, right? If I go to the, uh, the, uh, the desktop, if I close this down and go to the command prompt, can I ping 64.100.150.10? Can I ping the web server? And first couple may fail, right? Because I've got an ARP out, address resolution protocol. Who's my default gateway? So we know NAT is working based off of that because I wouldn't be able to get out of the inside network out to the internet and back if NAT was broken. So that's working. If I was to shut this down, I also should be able to come to HTTP colon slash slash 64.100.150.10 and it should say web server welcome to web servers. That's working too. That's great. So Andrew didn't get an address initially and it's a little quirky, so, you know, Packet Tracer again, it's software, and so there are some bugs. You see we got this DHCP4 ping conflict DHCP address. Server pinged 10.10.10.193. Well, why was that? So let's go back and look at the do show run for that DHCP, the pool. So this is the correct pool, right? That is the network that VLAN 30 sits in. So that error message that you see up here is that DHCP is smart enough that prior to assigning an address out of the pool, it's going to shoot a quick ping out. I think it shoots out two or three. It's going to try to ping the address it's getting ready to give to a host that's sending that DHCP uh, discovery request, right? Because remember, DHCP, it's Dora, discover offer, request, uh, yeah, I think it's request or reply, and then uh, accept, right, D-O-R-A. And so when, that or when the discovery goes out, the DHCP server, in this case the router, is going to check to see is somebody already using that address. And so we get this conflict here because who's using that address? Yeah, exactly. It's actually the router. That is the default gateway. It's the router. But it's the DHCP daemon is smart enough to say, okay, well, I ping that. That's being used. So I'm moving to the next address, which is 194, which is the address that we were given here. So it's smart enough to figure that out. But again, this is good. And it's okay that DHCPD figured that out. But what do you want to do? Right, you want to exclude the addresses that you think may get used. So IP DHCP excluded addresses, and it's 10.10.10.193, right? Because that is the default gateway address. Now, do we get a point for that? No, we don't. But that is the best practice. We know we're using that address for the default gateway, so exclude it, right? Don't leave it up to DHCPD to maybe overlook something, make a mistake, you know, not send the ping, whatever, and then you get conflicting addresses on your network. So you want to make sure that you take care of that. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this here. Let's make sure. So verify. Okay, so here, verify remote access to HQ switch uh, using SSH from the PC. So I actually need that PC back. And what are we not configured on the switch? Right? So remember, we configured some VLANs, but what did we not do? Yeah, I didn't configure anything on the switch. So let's get in there. Let's knock that out. And this is Cisco EN Pass. That was our enable password. We go into global config here. So interface VLAN 60. So what am I creating here? Am I creating VLAN 60? No. I'm going in and creating the switched virtual interface, the SVI. This is the layer three interface that's going to represent this VLAN, VLAN 60. And it's gonna be my default gateway. So we're gonna say IP address, whoops, IP address is 10.10.10.146. Is that right? Yeah. 10.10.146, and VLAN 60 is using a slash 255.255.255.240, a slash 28. So I put the IP address on there. You can see we're only four points away from freedom here. So we've got the right IP address on here. 
So let me see. Remember we talked about the switch being able to ping out. Now I know this isn't going to work, right? Because I know there's a problem still. And it, it's probably one of the most common challenges that you see. So I put the IP on there and I say, okay, good. So now I want to ping 64. I want to ping the internet. Remember, we set up the NAT, so this should work. I want to ping 64.100.150. Dot 10. And it doesn't work. Now this is this traffic I'm typing, this is traffic being generated by the switch, right? Control plane traffic. So okay, well, can I ping the gateway? Maybe I can ping 10.10.10.145. So can I ping my default gateway? Well, that works. So this is where it can be misleading. You may think, okay, well, NAT is broken. It's got to be NAT. That's the problem. But we already showed that NAT is working from the staff PC. Why is it not working here? And remember, this is where the switch, we have to look its perspective. We've got to look at the switch as a node. Think of it like a PC right now. And the switch has no clue how to get to anything off of its network. So what if I was to try to ping the file server, 10.10.10.162? So we hit enter, it's gonna ARP, and it's gonna say the switch. Remember, this is traffic being generated on and by the switch. It's not transit traffic. So transit traffic is traffic that would be passing through the switch. In other words, and this is an, a very important concept. Transit traffic is the traffic that when I was on the PC and I said ping web server, right? That is transit traffic. It's going through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H. It's going through the switch. It is not destined to the management uh, uh, interface of the switch. It's not destined to the switch. It just wants to go through it. And it's the same thing holds true. When you are on the switch, the switch has no idea that its default gateway is this sub interface. Yeah, is that that sub interface right there for the management VLAN, right? All it knows is I can ping that management, uh, the default gateway, right? That's all it knows. It has no clue about how to, how to ARP and go out, right? Because we haven't given it its default gateway, which is what we need to do here. We need to tell it that, hey, for traffic being generated by the switch, which would be ping traffic, telnet traffic, SSH traffic, that, that we generate on the switch. If I was to say telnet here, or ping or SSH. That is traffic being generated by the switch, not transiting through the switch. So I need to tell this switch that its default gateway is 10.10.10. Uh, what is that interface? 145. And that is going to nick us a few extra points right there. So now when I say do ping, 10, or I'm sorry, 64, 64.100.150. Dot 10, now it works. Now it works, right? Okay, so we've got that done. So we're missing three points here. And let me take a quick look. Let me save the config here. And let's see what we've got. So everything looks good there. And it's probably a typo on my part a typo on my part. Let's check our results here and let's see. What is it that we overlooked? Ah, excellent. And yeah, that was definitely an oversight on my part. The native VLAN keyword and gig01 on the HQ switch. Ah, and it's looking for the native VLAN. Okay, so the native VLAN got me on this one. So here is what we need. This is what we're missing. Uh, and again, it did tell me the native VLAN completely overlooked it. So on the switch, right, I need to make sure on that trunk port, we go into interface gigabit ethernet 01, and I need to say 
switch port trunk native VLAN 45, right? That was what was missing on the switch config, and that was a two-pointer there. That hurt us big time. All right, because again, traffic, and what is that native VLAN? It's traffic that shows up on that trunk port, right, that's going to transit the trunk port that is missing an 802.1Q tag. So untagged traffic that goes across that trunk port will be tagged with the native VLAN tag, VLAN 45. And then uh, we were missing it on, and I thought we did that, but we did not here on the router interface gigabit ethernet 00.45 because I was so wrapped around the axle of that incap.1q command, what I forgot to say was incap.1q45 and then native, right? Make that the native VLAN interface. And that now brings us to a solid 75 out of 75. All right, well, this is going to wrap up Packet Tracer Activity 1.3, Dot one dot three. It is our first skills-based assessment for the Networking 3 Scaling Networks course. Again, hopefully this has clarified a lot of things and solidified your understanding and reviewed a lot of the prerequisite material from Networking 1 and Networking 2. All right, again, appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and good luck the rest of this semester.